Mrs Holdsworth and I'm the principal at Earlham and Caddyset Academy. Earlham and Caddyset Academy is part of United Learning, which is one of the largest multi-academy trusts in the United Kingdom. We are a school of standards and character and we're very proud of that. We expect the best of all our students and to do this we focus on four key pillars. These are respect, enthusiasm, ambition and determination and we instil these values into all of our students. It's our business to provide the best all-round education for our students. We do this in our day-to-day -day lessons where teachers offer support and challenge on all levels. The atmosphere here is calm and purposeful which enables all students to reach their full potential. We build a culture of achievement and success here at the Academy. And we're proud of our facilities and the school grounds. We've got a lovely modern building, we've got 3G pitches, fantastic performance hall and a construction centre as well. Our teachers are committed to everything that they do. This is reflected in the energy and enthusiasm of our students. We've got a fantastic team of teachers here in all the subjects and our teachers always put the students first, both academically and socially. We believe it's our job to help every child succeed. Now normally at this time of year we'd be able to invite you into the academy so you could see this for yourself, uh, but unfortunately that's not, that's not going to happen this year due to Covid. Um, but what we've done is we've done the video uh, instead and hopefully you'll be able to get a feel and an insight into our Academy ethos um, by watching the video. Hello, my name is Mr Brown and I'm the Vice Principal responsible for the pastoral care at the Academy. My roles include overseeing attendance, behaviour and safeguarding the students. We're very proud of the high standards that we've put in place at the Academy, ensuring that students can learn and teachers can teach making progress all the way through from year seven to year 11. We develop students' character through our Aspirations programme and PSHE, supporting their development through extracurricular activities and the four pillars of READ, respect, enthusiasm, ambition and determination. We hope to see you at this academy soon. Hi there, my name is Mrs Larson Taylor, Acting Vice Principal in charge of Quality of Education and Outcomes. One of the things at Salem and Cadderstead Academy that we take great pride in is making sure that we have a rich and diverse curriculum that caters to all of our students' learning needs. Not just based on the latest government guidelines, but also about what's going to help them with their future successes for their entire life and supporting them in raising their aspirations. A massive part of what we do here as well is monitor and support our students with targeted interventions because it is ultimately all about the success of our learners and making sure that they are happy for the rest of their lives. Hi, I'm Mrs Jones, Assistant Principal here at ICA. As you can see, I'm stood next to the ICA Way poster and this is displayed in every single classroom which ensures that our lessons are engaging, purposeful and maximum progress is reached by every single student. I'm also the Senko here at school and we offer an inclusive school where we support all students who may come to us with an SEM need. We work with external agencies such as educational psychologists, speech and language therapists and we will ensure that your transition from primary school is a smooth one. We're really looking forward to meeting you soon. Hello, I'm Mrs Sweeney. I'm one of the assistant principals with responsibilities for safeguarding and transition. Our transition process starts years before your child comes to our academy. There are two key areas. The first is to relay any anxieties parent, parents or students might have about starting here and becoming part of our school community. The second is to share our high academic and behaviour expectations with you. We feel it is important to share what makes Earl and Caddy Said Academy such a wonderful and welcoming school. All this information and more can be found on our website and if you have any further questions don't hesitate to phone or email the Academy. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Mrs Lightfoot and I'm the Head of Year 7 here at ICA. I'm also part of the Transition and Safeguarding teams too. We have a very supportive and effective transition programme here at the Academy. 
When Chair 7 arrived, we budgeted them up with the Year 10 Pay Mentors to help support them, and we also have anti-bullying ambassadors who support the students too. This year, we've been really fortunate to receive funding for students to be trained as mental health champions. We are really extremely proud of our supportive students here, and they always help to ensure your child will have a smooth transition to high school. Whether they're in Year 10 or Year 7, they're always here for them. So, it's time for me to hand over to the real stars of our academy, our new Year 7 students, who are so excited to tell you how well they have settled into our academy. Thank you. I knew I didn't need to be worried about starting high school because what I knew from the induction day made me confident about coming to the school. My favourite subjects are technology, computing, art and music. I'm very proud to be a part of ICA. Honestly, the thought of going to high school was crazy. I thought I was going to get lost, but now I'm in the school, I know my way around. The equipment in ICA is absolutely outstanding, and so is the teachers. They encourage you to push your limits to the best. Um, my favourite subjects are history, art and um, drama, and I can see my future, and this is a decision I'll never regret. When I first started high school, I was a bit scared, but when we got here, the teachers were so welcoming and helpful. At first, I was scared of getting lost, but now I know my way around. My favourite classes are history, P and art because they make the lessons fun. I have made so many new friends and I am happy that I'm a part of Earl Mechanical Academy. When I was in primary school, I was worried about getting lost or not fitting in with other people. Now I feel a lot better and I found my way through the school in the second day. So don't be worried about getting lost. I thought school was going to be very scary, but when you get used to it, it will be fantastic. There's a lot of fun things to do, including PE and after school clubs. My three favourite subjects in ICA are history, geography and PE. When I started high school, I was nervous about making friends. I loved a science lab because it has loads of chemicals. All the teachers are so kind and nice. I settled in well. My favourite subjects are science, art and technology. Part of high school was scary. I, I soon settled in though with the help of the sporting teachers and I now feel proud. I have met lovely teachers and uh, friends. I enjoy the, the new opportunities like drama and the after school clubs. I believe this school is great and my future here will bring a lot. When I'm older I want to be a theatre actor and with the help of ICA I know I can achieve it. Hi, my name is Sienna and I'm a principal student at Earlham and Caddy's Ed Academy. Part of my role is meeting every fortnight to discuss matters affecting students. I'm happy to be a principal student because I'm proud of the school and its high standards. Hi, my name is Declan and I'm the principal student here at Earlham and Caddy's Ed Academy. I make up part of the student leadership team. The student leadership team is where two students from each year group are selected to represent their peers. I'm extremely proud of the school and its values, which are respect, enthusiasm, ambition, and determination. Hello everyone, I'm Mr. Bridge, the curriculum leader for English. Welcome to the English department. Here at Earlham and Cadiset Academy, we want to inspire our pupils to love literature and love English. It's such an important subject. It helps us make sense of the world around us. It helps us to communicate clearly and precisely, but best of all, it helps you to be creative and imaginative. A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one. We cover a range of books, plays and poems at Earlham and Caddy said, old and new. At Key Stage 3, our curriculum covers traditional and well-known texts such as Dracula and Of Mice and Men. We study a Shakespeare play each year at Key Stage 3. The fantastic Midsummer Night's Dream, the dark and dastardly Richard III in Year 8, and the terrible tale of betrayal in King Lear in Year 9. Some of our texts are challenging. We want to challenge our pupils, but we try to make all our work accessible and enjoyable. Let's take a look at Year 7, who are studying Treasure Island at the moment. On cold well winter's evening in 1883, the doors of my father's inn, the Admiral Ben Bow, were thrown open. His heavy frame, no match for the cold summer wind. Fog had gathered outside, and the silhouette of a blurred shape stood defiantly at the doorway. My father was accustomed to travelling folk, often men who lingered too long at sea and were weary and needed a place to stay. 
This one was different though. His mating gait and his lumbering steps made the quiet neighbor folk of the inn take note. Okay. Announcing his desire to stay the night, alongside his demands for countless strands of rum or whiskey, the serious man of the scene made his presence known, and ensconced in the corner under the flickering lights of the cup for the of the sporadic candles that framed the small booth, this unknown buccaneer began to entice his eager listeners with his wild tales of wild storms at sea, adventures upon the dry Tortugas, and the unwavering quest for hidden treasures. Tell us more, Captain! What happened next? The bottom print by a dead marlin's pipe. Yo, 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 and a parcel of rum. And the cook's throat was marked beyond it had been gripped by fingers ten. And and there they lay, all good dead men, like break o' day in a bruising ken. Yo, 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 and a parcel of rum. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. And so it continued. The stay with us became more bawdy and more voracious. The night fell and his stories continued. He warned me to keep an eye out for the one lady captain. Hello everyone, I'm Mrs. Aviad, the curriculum leader of science. Science has changed our lives and is vital to the world's future prosperity and all students should be taught essential aspects of the knowledge, methods, processes and uses of science. Through building up a body of key foundational knowledge and concepts, students should be encouraged to recognise the power of rational explanation and develop a sense of excitement and curiosity about natural phenomena. The purpose of our curriculum is to enable students to succeed both academically and vocationally by giving them the opportunities to broaden their science capital, which they can take into the working world and will aid them in creating a STEM-related career, should they wish. The Science Department is dedicated to raising standards and the improving results seen across the science GCSE routes show how hardworking our staff and students are. In Year 7, students will have the opportunity to develop their own understanding of science through the topic of cells, energy, reproduction, forces and biodiversity. Moving through the school, there are more opportunities to study the earth, space and quantitative chemistry. There is so much more. Please don't hesitate to contact me, Mrs Aviad, to discuss any further questions that you may have. We need to be able to, in science, detect which is which. Okay, because we don't want to be drinking the hydrochloric acid thinking it's water, do we? No? Yeah, it wouldn't end very well, would it? It would not be very well. Okay? So, scientists have come up with something called the pH scale to help you decide when something's an acid and when something's an alkali. Okay? So, this end of the scale, the red end, do we think that's acids or alkalis? Anybody know? Acids. If you can pop your hands up for me, please. Yep. An acid. Brilliant. Okay. So anything with a pH from 1 to 6 is an acid. What about something with a pH from 8 to 14? What would that be? Alkaline. Alkaline. Yeah, it's brilliant. Okay. So then we've got the alkalis. Now, does anybody know what's this code in the middle? pH 7. What's it called when something has a pH of 7? Neutral, brilliant. And do we know any substances which might have a neutral pH? Water. Water, excellent. Okay. So on your worksheets, you've got a pH scale. You've got acids, neutral, and you've got alkalis. So before I do a quick demonstration for you, what I'm going to do is we're going to check that you okay. can remember. So I have on the desk here, normally I'd be able to let you do it, I have a clear solution and a clear solution okay so both of them are totally clear can we tell the difference without reading the label no, no. no they look pretty much the same okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my goggles on which don't always look the best over glasses so don't laugh okay looks like a, a fly with a million pairs of eyes 
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put some hydrochloric acid into my massive measuring cylinder, okay? Some of this in, yeah. Not that much, perfect. Right. I'm now going to add a universal indicator. So this changes the colour of the solution depending on whether it's an acid or an alkali. So can anybody tell me when I pour this into the acid, what colour should my acid go? Anybody that's not answered today? Yeah. Red. Red. Okay, can we see if it goes red? Yeah, fingers crossed, bit of magic. Perfect, okay. So it goes red. Can everyone see? Yeah. So just by adding universal indicator, it's gone red. So that tells me it's a strong acid, it's hydrochloric acid, okay? Now, this is where we do a bit of trial and error because I'm incredibly clumsy. I'm going to add my alkali, okay? So you just have to bear with me for a second. Hopefully this works. Can anybody see it changing colour? Yeah. Can anyone? Yeah. And if I put a bit more acid in the top. Science. You see? Science. So, what colour is it at the bottom? Green. 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 green, right. So if it's green, what have I made at the bottom? What sort of solution? Yeah. If it's green, think back, what was green? Yeah. Neutral. So where I've got lots of acid and lots of alkali, they've cancelled each other out and I've ended up with a neutral solution, okay? Yeah. So could you drink like that? Well, theoretically, the stuff at the bottom, I could. Am I going to? No. Wouldn't be a very good idea, would it? No? So, you can see, as it gets higher up, it's getting more and more acidic, yeah? Less and less neutral. Now, we can keep adding a bit more, if, if you like, see if we can get it to go a different colour, shall we try? Yes. Elephant yeah? Toothpaste. Try. Well, we can't do elephant's toothpaste because I've not got the other stuff for it, unfortunately. But maybe, because you've been so well behaved today, maybe I can sort that out for another time. Okay, Miss can do it with you. So, let's try and add a bit more in. Because blue. 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 How can I make this go back to green? Anybody, any suggestions? How can I make it go back to green? Yeah. Could you add the acid? You could add the acid, okay? So let's add a bit more acid. See what happens. Well, that's even better now, isn't it? Okay. Yes. It's, so here I've got an acid. Here I've got neutral. At the bottom, it's slightly alkaline. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Now, later in year seven, you will do all about acids and alkalis, and I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that by then we're allowed to do practicals that you can all have a go, maybe make a mini one of these for yourselves in a test tube, yeah? Hi Year 6, my name is Miss Hibbert and I am the Head of Maths at Earlham and Cadisset Academy. Uh, in our maths team we have got seven maths teachers, all of whom love maths um, and are really excited by the prospect of you coming here next year. What I wanted to tell you about was what we learn in Year 7 and how um, the sets are kind of arranged. So when you first join the school, uh, you'll be in mixed ability groups um, up until the first half term and then after that we'll kind of slowly put you into groups that we think are best suited. So the first term is a real chance for you to have a clean slate, show us what you're made of um, and work with lots of different people from different schools. In that first term what we'll be looking at is number problems. So a lot of things that you will have seen before, such as fractions, decimals, percentages, factors, multiples and primes and place value. These things you may have seen before, but what's really important is that you spend that first half term really making sure you're super confident with those things and catching up on any gaps that you may have had from primary school. If you know that you're already really confident, you have to make sure you tell the teacher and they'll really push you and extend you onto much harder problems. After the first half term, we start to go into other types of maths. We look at algebra problems, we look at statistics problems, we look at shape problems and we look at angles problems. So again, a lot of these topics you may have seen before in primary school, but what we endeavour to do in year seven is fill any gaps that may have been there, make sure that you are super confident so that when you move on to the harder stuff in year eight and nine, etc., you are really super confident and you've got a good foundation knowledge.
So what is the first thing you label Charlie? Um, the hypotenuse. And what's the hypotenuse? The side opposite the right. Perfect. And then after that, what side do you label Brigitte after your hypotenuse? The adjacent. What's the adjacent? It's in between the angle. Perfect, and the last side is O, for the opposite. And O is opposite the angle given. Charlotte, what's the O? Opposite the angle given. Good, it's not opposite the right angle, it's opposite the angle given. So, there, that's the most important step. Any questions? So the first thing is you label the hypotenuse. What's the hypotenuse, Stanley? Um, the length. Well, the length opposite the right angle. So, I want you to draw the first triangle on your whiteboard and label it. Three, two, one, hold your whiteboard up. Wow, this is so cool, Mr. Morgan is so good at maths. Yes! Spot on, that is the correct answer. So, your labels should be as follows. H is opposite the right angle, O is opposite the angle given, and A is in between the two angles. Superstar. So, everyone's good with labelling the triangle. The next step is to identify which ratio we use. So, trigonometry is all about sine, cos, and tan. So, sine is the ratio between the opposite and hypotenuse length, cos is the ratio between the adjacent and hypotenuse, and tan is the ratio between the opposite and adjacent. That sounds really complicated, but I'll show you how simple it is in this example. So, who have we not picked on? Lily, label triangle. Um, the one opposite the right angle is the uh, height. Good. Next. And the A is between the right angle and the angle given. Good. The Next. Angle is opposite the angle. Perfect. You've got one mark. You've labelled your triangle. Next mark. We need to pick our ratio. So what are we given and what do we need, Eve? And what are we trying to find? The Perfect. So, we are given the adjacent, we need the opposite. So that means we're going to use tan. Okay, any questions so far? Perfect. Now, we fill in our triangle. So, the angle always goes with the ratio. So, because it's tan, it's tan 35. If it was sin, it'd be sin. What did I do wrong? Sine. Sine. Good, you're correcting me. If it was sine, it'd be sine 35. It'd be cos, it'd be cos 35. The angle always goes with the trig ratio. Now, the opposite is what we've labelled x. So we're just going to leave the x, and the adjacent is 12, so we fill 12 in. Important to note, in your calculator, I want you to put 12 times tan 35. Because the next to each other would be times. If we have the value on top, it would be divide. So in your calculator, watch that in. We haven't got an answer. What did you get me here? 8.4. We haven't got 8.4 or something. Right, super. Any questions? Right, you can do this question on your own. Off you go. Find the length x. Let's see if you can do trigonometry after 20 minutes. Hello, my name is Craig Thomas. Uh, I'm the head of history at Earlham and Caddy's Ed Academy. And I'm just going to explain a little bit about what history is and what you would study if you come here. Uh, history is the study of the past, which is everything that's happened up to this point I'm speaking to you. Um, it's a study of people, um, you, us, um, and how the world's been shaped by us as well. And when you come to Earlham and Caddy's Ed, you'll look at lots of different topics in history, all the way back from the Neolithic times, 35,000 years ago, up to the present day. And you'll study lots of different topics, the Romans, the Vikings, the uh, Victorians, World War I and World War II as well. And you'll also learn about different skills. So, for example, how to explain about the past, um, cause, chronology, consequence, what do those words mean? We're also big on going on trips as well in history, so we do one to Conway Castle in Wales and also to Auschwitz in Poland. 
Um, so I look forward to meeting you and teaching you when you do actually come here and learn about all the amazing topics uh, about the past. We've got two teams of three countries. Okay. So your first team or your first alliance is called the Triple Alliance. So triple because there's three. And that was Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. They were all in a team in World War One. Okay. The other team is the Triple Entente. And Entente's like a French word for friendship. So we've got France in this one, and we've also got Britain and Russia. They were in a team of three. So literally, World War One was these three against these three. And that date is just the year that those teams were made. Okay? Right, go on, Ethan. Halfway through the war, didn't it switch sides? It did switch sides, yeah, and uh, it went to the other side, yeah, that is right. Go on, Tom. I'm just saying, Britain and France were that much of an ally at that time. It was Br like they started the war, yeah. and a couple of days later, I'm pretty sure that Britain actually joined the war, and I was not wrong. Britain, and, well, when, the, when it all kicked off, Britain did actually go over to help France because Germany invaded France, so the alliance was pretty strong at the start of the war. So this is what, it, uh, just before um, you write it down, and I will let you write it down, this is a map of what it looks like. So you've got your triple alliance down the middle, Germany, Austria, Hungary and Italy, and your triple entente, Britain, France and Russia in purple there. So if you're thinking about military, if you've got a military mind and you're thinking about a war, which team or alliance do you think has an advantage out of those two, geographically, on the map? So if a war kicked off, which team or alliance might have the advantage? You could argue something for both sides, really. Go on, Hannah. So if you're all together, why is that an advantage? Yeah, so you might be able to share your army, and you might be able to put it all together to make a big one. Brilliant. Go on, Tom. Uh, triple on Tom, well, yeah, go on. Because France is on one side, Russia's on the other side. Yeah. So, what what are the beginning with S? The surrounded. surrounded. Okay. Now, what would you do with what's going to be a disadvantage for this team as well? What's going to be a potential disadvantage? So, if all these countries are attacking these three countries, why might these be a disadvantage? What are they going to have to do? Go on, Ethan. Oh, I was about to say naval blockade. Yeah, we'll come to that in a bit. I'm just thinking maybe land battles at the minute. So if these declare war and these declare war, why might these be a disadvantage? Go on, Katie. Um, because... Okay. Think about armies, okay? The milit military. If I'm getting attacked on this side, and I'm getting attacked on this side, and I've got my army here, in the middle, what am I going to have to do with my army outfit? So I'm literally going to have to do what with my army? I'm going to have to split it. Now if I send half my army here, because Britain and France are attacking me, and I send half my army here, because Russia is attacking me, am I going to be as strong as if they were all together? No, I'm going to be weaker. So in a way, it's good that together, because you can share stuff, but they're going to have to split their army. That's why Germany eventually thinks of a plan to try and knock these two out before they get onto this one, which is the, the mega country Russia. Okay? So what one's your book now? So next to alliance is. This lesson, we're going to look at what naturally might have caused our climate to change. The last lesson, we went back and we went back millions of years, possibly even billions of years, right to the start of our Earth. And we looked at how climate has changed, how we've gone through these periods where the climate has been very cold, and we've gone through these periods where the climate has been warmer. And then we looked at how we know that, how we know that for over thousands of years our climate has changed. In this lesson, we're going to look at what might have caused it to naturally change. If we get up to it, but if not, it'll be next lesson, then we'll look at the human process, processes that have caused it to change. What we're going to do is really high level stuff. This stuff used to be on the old A level, and then it got brought down to the GCSE. And now you're doing it in year nine. So it's going to really, really involve a lot of thinking from you today. From the start of this time on Earth, doesn't it? We know that if we go back thousands of years, millions of years, our climate on Earth has always gone through warmer periods, and it's always gone through colder periods. 
We know even just looking at a small snapshot that when the Vikings were invading different areas, actually it was a lot warmer. Greenland actually was green, lovely, luscious. It's not at the moment, it's a bit colder. But we know it was warmer in medieval times when we built these big monasteries that had huge ceilings to keep them nice and cool. <coughs> and then we also know that we've gone through ice ages on Earth. We know the woolly mammoth. We know that we've been through times even in more recent times when Earth has been colder, hence the River Thames freezing over, hence Charles Dickens writing about Christmas and Christmas always being snowy and cold, when really, I mean, it's cooler, but we don't get loads of snow at Christmas anymore. So we know that climate has always changed. And this can't just be down to us as humans, because it changed even before humans lived on Earth. And we know that from looking back at those things, those pieces of evidence that we studied last lesson. We know looking at tree rings and ice cores that climate has not always been the same. So there must be some natural reasons as to why climate has changed. It can't actually all be our fault. And there are some natural reasons and we're going to go through them this lesson. There are three main natural causes of climate change. We're going to take each one in turn. I'm going to explain it to you, and then you need to do a little bit of a diagram of each one and a few notes. Some of them slightly easy, volcanic eruptions. Some of them a little bit more tricky. We're going to work up to that one. So the three main reasons, the natural causes of climate change. The first one, volcanic eruptions have caused our climate to change. So, I would like you to do a subheading of volcanic eruptions. I would like you to do a very basic drawing of what happens in this. And then I'd like you to write these bullet points down so that we know what happens, please. Your drawing doesn't have to be particularly artistic. I'm more bothered about the annotations, please. So, draw and then write down those notes in that box for me, please. I'll give you five minutes to do that. Okay, so over the last few lessons we have been looking at using flowcharts to plan our programmes with. And what I'd like us to do is practice the different flowchart shapes that we need to use in order to make those flowcharts. So you're going to use your mini whiteboards with your, with your whiteboard pens and, and rubbers. Okay, and the first shape I'd like you to draw is the start-stop shape, please. Once you've drawn it, just hold it up really clearly so I can see it. Fantastic. 
<laughs> okay, well done guys, let's have a look. Okay, yes, we've all got the subroutine shapes. So we've got those key shapes that we use as we are creating flowcharts. So what I'd like you to do is to take those flowchart symbols and apply them to the exam question that you're working on in your books, please. Okay, so you will notice that the exam question that you've got for you uses a flowchart. It gives you a flowchart already. It asks you to interpret it, and then it asks you to make a flowchart of your own. Okay, I'd like you to be working on that flowchart question using these shapes that we've been practicing, please. Let's make a start. Hi, I'm Mr Prescott, Head of PE here at Earlham and Kelly's Ed Academy. Here at ICA, and within the PE department, we pride ourselves on delivering a broad and challenging curriculum, underpinned by the United Learning PE and Health curriculum. Our aim is to ensure that all students leave the academy appreciating the value of physical activity and lifelong participation in sport. Now as a child, PE and school sport provided me with so many happy memories, and our job as a department is to ensure that this happens for the children of our wonderful community. Brilliant. Anyone know why we do that hips to lips? Noah? It's actually we have one of the Brilliant. We're nice and aerodynamic, alright? And we're in a nice straight line so we can generate some force going forward. Yes? I want us to, on the first one, I'm not going to let us drive our arm. Because remember, I want you to experience what it's like to have no technique so you appreciate the technique a little bit more. Okay? So we're going to go back to the first one. We're going to have straight arms, straight legs. All right, will we look daft? Yes, but I want you to appreciate the technique. Lads on the end, on your feet, please. Number one, are we in the back? Are we in number two? Yeah, we're on number two. Number two. All right, this time we're going to the second line. Remember, we're appreciating the technique, so I'm going to take that away from you. Straight arms, straight legs. To the second blue line, and then we're just gonna jog back, then it's number ones go. Are we ready? Number twos, take your mark. Set, go. I was right. I was right, you do look a bit that. Are we ready? Number ones, off you go. Straight arms, straight legs, I like it. I like it, a bit faster, a bit faster, a bit faster, a bit faster. Faster, come on. Good. All right, boys. So, can we get the full pace showing me the technique you just have? I want to try. All right, I don't think we can. Because we can't generate the force with our muscles to do so. So, task is now. We're going to put all of the technique together. So, we're going to look at the difference between what that looked like and felt like to what the proper technique looks like and feels like. Knee drive, parallel to the floor. Nice high knees, all right? Arms, hips to lips. What do we do with our head? Keep it straight. Nice fixed head, focus on your finish point. Are you ready, number twos? This time we're gonna go, all right? Second blue line again. Showing me the full technique. Take your mark. Everything. You're gonna throw the whole technique in now, yeah? Take your mark. Set. Go. Full technique. Full technique. Good. Brilliant. Brilliant. And jog back in. Number one, step forward, please. Full technique. We're putting everything together. All right? Everything together. Take your mark. Set. Go. Full technique. Brilliant. All right, Anton, we just said then, all right, about our high knee drive. How did we describe it as a teaching point? We mentioned the knee drive and the floor. What do we say about the knee drive? High knees. Can you, Josh, can you help him? Brilliant. So thighs parallel to the floor. Because what that's going to do then, that's going to give us a nice long stride length. And we said before, didn't we, our long stride length is better than short stride length. Why is that? Shall I? Brilliant! It's because we're going a little bit further with every stride. Boys, are we concentrating? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so now we're going to put it all together. 
talked about our knee drive. What about daily? What about our arms? How do we describe that? Brilliant. Who's, we talked a little bit, we sound like a bit of a poet, don't we? What do we say? Hips to? Lips. Hips to lips. So can we remember hips to lips? If we can remember hips to lips and knee drive, we're nearly there. Last one, Freddie. What about our head position? Oh, but are we looking round all the time? No. No. What are we doing? Straight. Really, we're focusing on that finish line because we don't want to be wasting energy by looking round, seeing where our uh, opposition are. Okay. Now we're now going to go all together. A little bit of a little bit of self-evaluation, really. Now I'm going to give you about 30, 40 seconds, and I want you to get yourselves into groups of. Hi, I'm Miss Colgan. Here at ICA, I'm the acting head of MFL. At this school we have an exciting and challenging MFL curriculum which provides our learners with more of an understanding of the French culture. What's more, we run an extracurricular Spanish club and a Paris trip every year and we're hoping to resume this soon. I can't wait to see you all in September. Merci. Okay, okay. John, what's the first thing we do? Uh, we highlight the cognates. So we're highlighting the cognates. Highlighting words that you know you've got 30 seconds left to do so, please. Once you've done that, we're going to look for the different words and the different uses of reflexive verbs. So if you're stuck on them, have a read from this grammar box because you've just mentioned what they were. It's what you do to yourself. So are you doing your hair? You literally do the hair yourself. You have a shower yourself. I know it sounds really weird, but they don't need this in English. But only a few words in French take this form of reflexive then. Do that. Okay, um, after this you've got to look at the holiday list. So what things do people take on holiday with them? Now, has anyone managed to spot anything that you might take on holiday with you? Anyone managed? Luke, have you managed to find one? Joel, come on, Joel. Um, is sun cream. Sun cream, super out mate. Sun cream en français? Um, is that lunettes de soleil? <gasps> Presque, it's so close. It's not lunette de soleil, oh, it's de la lunette. la crème solaire. Merci, monsieur. Ouais, c'est vrai. Yeah, de la crème solaire. Sun cream. Un autre. Oui. Or an earphone. Super. How did you know they were earphones? Um, that was... How? Listen is acute. Super. That is fantastic. You know what, mate? I'm actually going to be positive for that. That was really, really good. Joy, you're going to get one as well. Thanks, De Dinner. Pas de problème. So we've got earphones, we've got a smartphone, you mentioned something. Emily, do you know this one? Um, do you know what lunettes de soleil is? Sunglasses. Super, how did you deduce that? Because uh, lunettes, I don't know. Go on, you know it. Lunettes mean what? Glasses. Glasses and soleil is sun. Super, so you put the two and two together. Sunglasses. Oui. Okay, super. Okay. <laughs> Merci, mademoiselle. So, what we're going to do now, you don't have to cover the table out then. So I think I'm going to take that, but what I want you to do is I want you to make a list, in French and in English, of all these items that you might take on holiday with you. And there are some more in the bottom one. There are some more in the bottom one, but they're a bit different. Has anyone read through the bottom one yet? Mm. No? Ellie, have you read through the bottom one? Highlight. Super easy, so you've highlighted the word smashing. Have you noticed, are they going to the same location? No, they're not. How did you know that? So these are going skiing, you know it's going to be somewhere cold. Therefore, the items that they take are going to be slightly different. So first things first, I want you to make a note of the list, uh, list all the different things they take on holiday with them, and it's going to be the exact same for these. Vous avez 30 seconds, you've got 30 seconds. Um, bonjour, je m'appelle Joel. J'aime bien le français parce que j'adore la culture. Je m'appelle Macy, à mon avis, j'adore le français car c'est vraiment cool.
Hi, year five and six. My name is Mrs. Colquitt and I'm the head of Expressive Arts at Erwin Kellerzell Academy. We're a creative department which consists of art, textiles, music and drama. The music is new to the curriculum this year, which is really, really exciting. And we've invested lots and lots of money to make it really, really work at the academy. So for all subjects of art and drama and music, we have one lesson per week. And for textiles, we have one lesson per three, well, for one term. So we run a rotation with technology. We do lots and lots of um, different projects and learn loads and loads of new skills. So you're going to find something that you're really, really good at and something that you enjoy. So not only the work that we do in our lessons, we also have loads and loads of extracurricular activities that we can offer you, um, which includes things like um, a fashion show, it could be um, the school performance, and it could also be the school choir. So we think we really can love your time here, and especially with our department. Right, so guys, so our class today, we're going to be looking at different kind of um, tonal techniques. So it's going to link to your drawing from last lesson, developing your skills, and it's going to be supporting um, your learning. Okay, so... If we're looking, to start off with, at this image, what formal elements of art would we consider if we had to draw something like this? Okay, so have a think. So if we had to produce an image like this, what formal elements of art would we consider? So we've got seven formal elements of art we just spoke about. We don't use them all. Okay, so Ethan, which can you name me one formal element of art? So if you had to draw this, what would you maybe consider? Texture. Texture, okay, brilliant. So why would you be looking at texture? What kind of areas, how would you, what would you be using for texture? What kind of technique, what would you maybe say this technique here is? Mm. Mm. Shading. So we've got some shading, but because we've got little lines on it, we've got little crosses, what technique would that be? Mm. Okay, Celeste, do you want to help them out? Cross hatching, brilliant. So we're looking at texture, brilliant. Annabelle, what else do you think we could use for that? Tone. Brilliant, tone. Why are we looking at tone? Why would you say tone? What's the difference between. Brilliant, we'll look at a dark area and we'll look at a light area. Of your pencil, going gradually from dark to light. Okay, so Ella, which is the dark, which. which um, what value is the darkest? What number would it be? Ten. Brilliant. And then the lightest would be value? Zero. So it's a white page. Brilliant. So then we said cross hatching. What cross hatching is, is when you're crossing over, so the darker your lines are and close together, it's going to be the darker the tone. And just like in the image, they use cross hatching. Okay, so Charlie, if we had to use the number three, um, a hatching technique, what would hatching be? How do you think that you could present hatching? I think just the little lines in the front of you are the darker and the darker part of the eye is white. Perfect, well done. Okay, yep, yeah. so we're going hatching, just little lines. That's normally quite a nice technique to use for applying tone. Okay, and the last one would be working the circular motion. So there's two different ways that you can be doing that. You can either apply your tone just by simply Circling, obviously, the tighter your circle, the darker you press through your dark tone, and then you're gradually blending it out. Or, what you could do is you can create lots of little circles. And you can get some really, really lovely techniques and outcomes with this. And it's, what it is today is the purpose of it is we're just developing your technique, we're developing your style, and we're going to be using this when we're making improvements to our, our cupcake drawing. Remember, we just took you to tonal shading bar. It's all about <coughs> control of your pencil, so you gradually go from dark to light. Okay, so really try and do it in one motion. If you need to go back home to some of the areas, please do, guys. Remember, you've got to use your skills learned to start with today, thinking about the different um, use of tone. How can you now present and reflect that in your work? So you're making improvements from previous work. Techniques to show depth in your drawing, make it look realistic. So you use your line, tone, form. Okay, so today, year seven, we're looking at doing fairground theme but mining. 
So what sort of skills did we need to think about? Yeah. <coughs> Creativity. Confidence. Confidence. Imagination. Imagination and body language. Body language. Yeah, to be dramatic. Dramatic. And what about this? What do we need to use? Facial expressions. Facial expressions. So this group are going to demonstrate to everybody else and then you're going to give some positive feedback. And why do we not give negative? What do I call it instead? Three, two, one. Okay, we're going to clap. What was fun about that performance? Liam. They didn't speak, so they used what, Jack? Uh, they used their miming. What else was good about it, Jack? They kept calm. They kept calm. Another one? I think the body language was good. And the body language was good. Okay. So what we're doing here is we're using keywords. We need to build it up into full sentences. Shall we watch another one? Who wants to go next? Here we go. Are you ready? Four. Okay. 
Okay, um, so put your hand up if you can tell me what type of wood it is that we were using. It's pine wood. It's pine wood, correct, well done. Okay, so we're going to have a recap on how to actually cut the piece of pine. So, what's the first thing? We're going to cut the pieces for the side of my jigsaw, these pieces. What's the first thing I need to do? Um, measure 11 centimetres on the wood. Correct, okay. So, to do that accurately, I need to be using a pencil and a ruler, okay. So get your piece of pie, get your pencil and ruler, and measure 11 centimetres, okay. I'm going to put a little dot there. So I'll put the little dot on the piece of wood, okay. Now, the tool that we're going to use to ensure it's at 90 degrees is called a what? A tri-square, well done. Okay, so take the tri-square, put it onto the top of the piece of pie, and then we're going to use the pencil and draw across. This is ensuring that it's accurate, okay? So we said our second lesson of the bit, uh, our third one, uh, lesson objective is to make sure that we're working accurately. So by using the tri-square, that's going to ensure that that's accurate, isn't it? Okay? Right, so we've mapped out on there. Then we're going to use this piece of equipment, okay, called the bench hook. Now what I recommend that you do, I'll work in the middle of the bench here because it'll be easier. I said if you put the bench hook inside the vise so it's not moving about, you'll find it a little bit easier, okay? So pop the piece of pine onto your bench hook and then you're going to use this saw. Can you remember what the name of this saw is called? Begin with a T. Maybe someone else wants to answer for Go on then, how was that? Close, okay, is a type of saw. This one's called a tenon saw, okay, T E N O N. I'll test you on that at the end of the lesson, okay. So, the tenon saw. So, remember, start off nice and slowly, okay. So, put your finger just by the side of the line, okay, nice and slowly, okay. Once you've done that, then obviously you can move your finger away and you can speak up a little bit. Remember to use quite a lot of the saw blade, about that much of it, and let the saw do the work, okay. If while you're cutting the saw does get jammed inside the wood, just pull it back and it will release and then you can carry on cutting. Okay? So nice controlled saw stroke. Okay? I said use about that much of the saw blade. So I'm cutting through. Okay, until you cut a piece of pine completely off. And then what's the name of this? Sandpaper. Sandpaper. Okay, so I'm going to use this to remove the what? What are these on the end of the wood called? Oh. Splinters. Splinters. Well done. Okay, so if you use that, I can remove some of those things from the wood. Okay, once you've got all those off, then these will be glued around the outside of the MDF, which is going to form our frame for our jigsaw puzzle. Okay. Okay, these are the current year 11s here at Earl McCaddy's Academy. We're on the construction course, construction of the built environment, levels one and two. Um, is where they learn all aspects of health and safety and several practical skills, allowing them to go to the next level, i.e. level three or the A levels, uh, where they go to level three at college and into apprenticeships, or they go to the A levels and then on to university to do their uh, HNDs, uh, degrees or even further into the industry such as uh, architects, quantity surveyors um, on all, all elements of professional levels of the uh, construction industry. Take that, get the excess, under there, and you've got a piece of puzzle out there. And then it's got to go flush with that one, and flush with that one over there, yeah? It's a level, or a straight edge, or get a piece of wood batten out of the, out of the um, garage. Yeah, but if you want to put, your best bet is put a piece of wood straight across there like that. There's the one in there. Yeah, there's loads of wood in there, you know what I mean? Okay, got her. Yeah, that's it. I meant that. Nice and flush with that. What I do is, is lay, I lay a load up dry first. Yeah, lay a load out dry. And you know, when you're gauging it, you know what I mean? And that will cut a bit 
Otherwise, what do you do? Is leaving. Do this. Look. All right. And then you bolt them up. Oh, you're in there, so you get your mortar. So can, I, can I lay it all down and then put the bricks on yeah. it and get rid of the access? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So if you do that there, look, it keeps the bricks dead straight as well. Once your first course is in, up you come, you know what I mean? And it's going to be about, it's going to be about eight courses. What we're looking at here now, like, one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight. Probably be a bit higher than that. Maybe what? nine. If you, if you get nine, that's mint. Get past that one. Though. Well, you, you're going to be there, aren't you? So, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's what you want. Oh, yeah. Then we'll be putting wood across there, then. Right, Liam. Why what's going on this bit? No, you're going in there. It's just wood going on there. Oh, yeah. Right, wood, and then the facial board and the roof. You know what I mean? Yeah. You good at that? Oh, Keep up sure. the benefits. <laughs> Alright. Yeah,